Hey everyone, thanks for tuning in. Today I'm gonna to show you how I designed and built this kitchen island. It has a reinforced butcher block countertop with an overhang for bar seating. It has a truly massive amount of drawer space. And unlike most kitchen islands, it's actually elevated off of the ground on four legs. It has two outlets and the electric feed for the outlets is actually hidden inside of one of the legs. All right, let's get started. I started by modeling the whole island in SketchUp. My normal building process is to roughly design pieces in SketchUp just to make sure all of the proportions look good, then switch to pencil and paper for the rest of the build, and that's the process that I used here. If you're interested in copying this design, I actually put together a pretty comprehensive set of plans with over 40 pages of detailed diagrams, dimensions, and instructions which I have for sale. I'll put a link to those plans in the description below. With the design finalized, I started by building the cabinet carcass. Since my workshop is a pretty small basement room, I needed to roughly break down my 3 quarter inch plywood sheets in the garage with a circular saw and a straight edge into workable sizes before moving them into the workshop. A pro tip is to use a sharpie to mark the factory edges of the plywood before breaking them down too far. Factory edges on plywood are more reliably straight and square than ones roughly cut with a circular saw, so later on in the build, those sharpened edges can be used as reference surfaces. After transferring my SketchUp model dimensions onto paper, I headed into the workshop. I designed the island to be made of two identical cabinets bolted together instead of one larger cabinet, because my workshop is a little too small to comfortably work with wide, six foot long pieces of plywood. Each of the two smaller cabinets is constructed from seven pieces of plywood. I used my table saw, referencing sharpie marked edges against the fence whenever possible, to cut out the 14 total plywood pieces to their final sizes. All of the joinery in the cabinet carcass are dado and rabbit joints. If you didn't know, dados are channels cut through the center of a piece, usually across the grain, and rabbits are channels cut along the edge of a piece. While both can be cut out with a normal table saw blade, if there are many joints to cut, it's faster to use a dado stack. Setting up the stack can be a pain because the stack of blades needs to be exactly the same width as the plywood, so it can take a while to fine tune it to get it just right with different size spacers. However, once it's dialed in, cutting all of the joints is lightning fast. When cutting a long dado or rabbit joint, make sure to put pressure down on top of the blade with a push block throughout the whole cut to ensure the dado has a consistent depth. For rabbits on the edge of the piece, it's easiest to set up a sacrificial fence. That way, the table saw fence can be pushed right up against the edge of the dado stack without doing any permanent damage to the saw. Again, even pressure on top of the blade with the push block is key to ensure a consistent rabbit depth. There's one dado on the back of each cabinet, which I chose to cut by hand simply for the fun of it. This dado could also be cut with the table saw, but it would involve cutting partially through the piece and then stopping. It wouldn't look as crisp because the cut would extend a little further than necessary, but it's a hidden area inside of the cabinet, so it wouldn't really matter. My perfectionism got the better of me here, and I used a handsaw, chisel, and a small router plane to cut this stopped dado without any electricity. Next comes the glue up of the carcasses. It's a little tough to glue up so many pieces of such a large cabinet all at once, so I used Type Bond 3, which has a bit more open time than other wood glues. I also used brad nails to hold everything together while the glue dried. With properly fit glued dado and rabbit joints, this cabinet is solid as a tank, even without the nails. 
I probably should have glued this up on the ground, but there's nothing wrong with standing on a table saw every once in a while. With everything nice and square, I assembled the second cabinet and let the glue dry for a few hours. Next comes the legs. I chose to have this island elevated a few inches off of the ground on four outer legs to make it look more like a piece of furniture than a massive cabinet just sitting on the floor of my kitchen. There's also a single additional leg hidden underneath the center of the cabinet, which hides the electric feed wires, which I'll talk more about in a bit. I laminated together four layers of poplar 1x4s for the feet stock so that they would be super solid. Once the glue dried, I squared them up with my hand plane, although a jointer or even an orbital sander would work fine for this. The legs consist of a short block of wood to hold the weight of the island, with poplar trim extending up the sides of the cabinet for extra strength. I glued and nailed together each leg assembly, making sure everything was nice and square. It's also important to remove any glue squeeze out on the inside of the legs, since they need to sit flush against the corner of the cabinet. An important design detail of the outer legs is that they taper outwards at the bottom. This makes the island look a lot more elegant and slender. To ensure that all of the legs have the exact same taper, I made a template out of some scrap plywood, then used it to trace lines onto the bottom of each leg. Then I cut out the tapers on the bandsaw and smoothed the rough cut surfaces with my hand plane. And with that, the outer legs are done. Next, I cut the rough opening for the outlet boxes. I made sure to place them in an area towards the back of the cabinet, but not so far back that the eventual outlet cover plate would overlap the cabinet leg. This style of box has paddles which swing out and grip the inside of the cabinet wall as a screw is tightened to hold the outlets firmly in place. Now was also a good time to cut some necessary access holes. A few to allow my drill to access screws which will eventually secure the butcher block countertop from underneath, and a few for eventual routing of electric wires inside of the cabinet. The last hole is on the bottom of one of the two cabinets at an angle. This is the hole that will continue through the bottom center foot and will hold the electric feed wire. Speaking of the center foot, it's made of the same laminated poplar stock and I started working on that next. I drilled an angled hole down through it, wide enough to fit Romex wire through. I drilled this hole before tapering the foot, which is the next step, because it's a lot easier to hold a square block in a clamp. And yes, I am drilling directly into my outfeed table. I cut out two of the tapers on the bandsaw, then taped the removed triangular offcuts back on to provide more support while cutting out the next two tapers. After some smoothing with my hand plane, this fifth and final foot is ready to go. At this point, I glued and nailed on the four outer legs and prepared to glue and screw together the two cabinet subassemblies to make the final combined island carcass. The connection between the two cabinets is critical for the structural integrity of the island, so I made sure to cover all of the surface with wood glue 
and I attached the two with lots of screws to help clamp things together while the glue dries. By orienting the cabinets on their side like this, gravity helps a lot too. By my math, the two cabinets combined weigh about 150 pounds, so things are quickly getting too heavy to move. To attach the bottom central foot, I used glue and four two inch long screws, pre-drilling for each. This joint needs to be strong enough to survive pushing the island around on the floor while finishing building it and transporting it to its final spot. The most important part of the placement of the central foot is that the angled hole lines up with the pre-drilled hole in the bottom of the cabinet. So I've realized that there's actually a problem with the design of my cabinet, um, and I knew it was going to be a bit of an issue when I was designing it in SketchUp, but I underestimated how big of an issue it was going to be. And now that I'm physically seeing this thing in front of me, I'm realizing that the issue is unavoidable and I have to take a step back and fix it. So what is the issue? The issue is that behind this leg, there's something like two and a half inches of empty space here. And the drawer that has to fit into this cubby is going to be have, have to be made narrower to account for that. And I thought, okay, well, I can just put a wooden spacer in here and attach the drawer slide to that and the drawer would open and close just fine. But it is a waste of that much space. And now that I'm looking at it and I see how much narrower this drawer is gonna to have to be compared to this drawer, and both of these drawers are also gonna to have to be made narrower, I think it's too much space to waste. Uh, so the way that I'm going to fix it is by cutting out a rectangle out of this front leg frame right there and I wish I had thought to do this before gluing and nailing this leg onto the cabinet carcass, but it is what it is. And I think I can actually do a pretty good job of fixing it by setting my circular saw just to the depth of this leg, which is three quarter inch, and cutting along a straight edge down to about this far. And then I can cross cut and finish this cut with a handsaw and hopefully with a pretty clean cut and a little bit of sanding, it'll look presentable, and uh, I'll have learned a lesson for next time. While I'm glad I realized this mistake in the moment and took action to fix it, in retrospect, I think that if I were to build another one of these islands, I probably would build the legs the same way. The circular saw method of cutting out these rectangles ended up being very fast, easy, and clean. After a quick round over of some of the exposed sharp edges of the legs, I moved on to adding some decorative trim. This trim doesn't contribute structurally to the island at all, which is why I'm using pre-primed MDF trim to save a little on costs. I cut them to length with the handsaw because the dust collection on my miter saw isn't great, and MDF sawdust can be really annoying to deal with. I glued and nailed the trim onto the back and sides of the island. The front edges of the cabinet at this point were all exposed plywood edges which were set back three quarters of an inch from the front face of the legs. Since the drawer fronts need to rest flat against a continuous surface, I ripped some three quarter by three quarter edge banding out of poplar on my table saw. By gluing and nailing this to all of the exposed edges on the front of the cabinet, I'm building up a sort of face frame of poplar which will look much better than the plywood edges when painted.
The cabinet is now heavy enough to where I can barely tilt it up without any help. Moving this thing upstairs into my kitchen is going to be a challenge. Now it's time for the drawers. These are also made out of 3 quarter inch plywood and also use rabbit joints to connect the four sides, so I won't go into too much more detail about those things, but I will instead focus on the differences between the drawer construction and the carcass construction. For one, the top edges of the drawers will be visible when the drawers are opened, so I used some store-bought birch iron-on edge banding to hide the plywood edges. I used a knife to trim off any overhang and a block plane to smooth down the corners. There are nice and fairly cheap edge banding tools specifically to do this, but since I don't apply edge banding very frequently, I did it the old fashioned way. After applying all of the edge banding, I cut the drawer fronts, sides, and backs to size, and again used a 3 quarter inch dado stack with sacrificial fence to cut the rabbits. One important thing to note here is that dado stacks are notorious for causing blowout on the back edges of cuts. Since blowout on the nicely veneered tops of the drawers would be very visible, it's critical to avoid this. My solution was to use a sacrificial piece of plywood to support the veneered side of the drawer whenever it was oriented at the back of the cut. The bottom panel of each drawer is made of plywood as well, and those panels fit in a groove which runs along the inside of all four faces of the drawer. The smaller drawers use quarter inch plywood for the bottom, but the bigger drawers use half inch plywood because a quarter inch spanning the full width of those drawers would bow down with the weight of cans of food and things stacked in the middle of it. Traditionally in drawer construction, the grain orientation of drawer bottoms is very important and thoughtful joinery is required to allow for expansion and contraction of solid wood panels. Since I'm using plywood here, the problem becomes much simpler. I cut the plywood to just barely smaller than the exact size required for the full drawer bottom to fit. If the bottom is too big, it will prevent the drawer joints from closing properly, and if it's too small, it might fall out of the groove. I aim for about a sixteenth of an inch too short in both dimensions, which makes the bottom fit just right, and will also help keep the drawer nice and square while the glue dries. The assembly of the drawers is very similar to that of the cabinet carcass, just glue and nails. However, I made sure to only nail from the front side of the drawer, which will be covered by separate drawer fronts, and the back of the drawer, which will be hidden. The sides of the drawers will be visible and won't get painted, so they should be nail free. Here's a pro tip, use a cheap plastic straw to get rid of glue squeeze out on inside corners. It's kind of amazing how well this works. There are two drawers in this island which have to be a little different from the others because they will bump into the outlet boxes. To account for this, I marked a notch to be cut out of those drawer pieces. I cut the notch out with my bandsaw and patched up the edge banding. I was a little worried that the notch would look a little like a tacky band-aid fix to the problem, but I'm actually really happy with how they turned out. I think they look very modern and intentional. <laughs> 
For drawer slides, I purchased full extension soft closed slides, which I'm quite happy with. They're a bit on the expensive end, but they're heavy duty enough to support these large drawers when loaded with heavy objects and fully extended, which is critical. One important thing to note when making drawers is to read the drawer slide instructions to know how much space needs to be left on the sides of the drawers to fit the slides. In this case, I had to make sure my drawers were exactly one inch narrower than their openings to allow for a half inch on either side for the slides. It's pretty critical to get that spacing exactly right, so I made sure to triple check all of my measurements when building the drawers. There are a lot of great videos out there already about how to install drawer slides, so I won't go into too much detail. I used a plywood spacer when installing the slides onto the drawers to keep their location consistent across the different drawers, and I used an awl to mark the screw holes and pre-drilled before final installation. To install the slides for the smaller drawers into the cabinet carcass, I used some quarter inch pieces of plywood to space the slides off of the bottom of the opening, ensuring that they are level from front to back. For the middle row of drawers, I made custom spacers out of scrap plywood as well. The only important thing here is that the bottom right drawer slides are one inch higher because there needs to be enough space for the electric feed line to run underneath the drawer. When the drawer fronts are eventually attached, this won't be visible. After applying some caulk to some slight gaps that are a little too big for paint to cover, I used some wood filler to quickly fill all of the brad nail holes. Once that dried, I lightly sanded off the excess filler and primed the carcass. I used high quality Benjamin Moore paint and primer for this project, and I applied it with a roller and a brush. I'm not an expert on painting cabinets, but ultimately I'm very happy with how that aspect of this project turned out. I'm pretty confident I would have gotten a better finish if I had used a paint sprayer, but I've never used one before and I was more comfortable with this method. Once the primer dried, I pre-drilled holes in the bottom of the four feet, which will be used later when I bolt the island to the kitchen floor. Also after priming, I found a void in the plywood on the back of the carcass, so I cut it out with a knife and filled it with some wood filler. In retrospect, I wish I had plugged it with a piece of wood first, because this thickness of wood filler took a very long time to dry enough to sand and repaint, which ended up actually slowing down the project quite a bit. Interestingly, the next step in the project was actually dictated by the weather. I would have preferred to finish this project completely in my workshop, but it was a little snowy and icy outside and a big storm was coming, which was going to dump a ton of snow that would stick around for a long time. My plan for moving this thing upstairs into my kitchen was to carry it out through the garage, up the sloping yard, and in through the back of the house. So I either had to move it now or wait a few weeks for the snow to melt. My wife and I whipped out the moving straps and got the job done without slipping on too much ice. The snow started a half hour after we finished this move, so we pretty much nailed the timing on that. At this point, I was still waiting for that wood filler to dry before I could paint the island, so I went to work on the countertop. This is one and three quarters inch thick Baltic birch butcher block countertop that I purchased from a big box store. It comes in a 72 inch by 39 inch slab, and my design calls for the length to be closer to 65 inches, so I chopped off the end with a circular saw and a straight edge, then rounded over the rough corners with a router. <laughs> 
I designed the countertop to overhang the back of the cabinet by 12 inches, which is a little too far to leave it unsupported, especially given the grain direction of the countertop. I don't personally like the look of visible supports, especially since people sitting at the overhang on bar stools are likely to bump their knees into them, so I opted to reinforce the countertop itself. For reinforcement, I used two 3 by 36 inch steel flat bars, which I recessed into the bottom of the countertop with a router. I drilled and countersunk holes in the steel every few inches and screwed them in along their entire length. I'm not sure if this steel is the best choice for reinforcement, as it does have a little bit of a flex to it, but I think that by using many screws and by fitting the steel into a precisely cut recess, it will provide enough strength to support the expected loads on the edge of this island. With the wood filler finally dried, sanded, and primed, I next painted the island carcass. What you're seeing here actually isn't the final color of the island. I decided I wasn't happy with this color and later bought a slightly darker shade. The final color that I ended up using was Benjamin Moore Jojoba, which I like quite a bit. My wife helped carry the newly reinforced countertop upstairs and we placed it on the island. I moved it around to get it exactly centered then I used a brad point bit to mark the screw hole locations in my pre-drilled holes from beneath. We then removed the countertop and I pre-drilled at those locations for the screws. I used a long bit holding extension in my impact driver to secure the countertop to the island with 16 screws. For the finish on the countertop, I used cutting board oil and butcher block conditioner. These are basically just mineral oil with maybe a little bit of wax added and are totally food safe. The downside to this finish is that it needs to be reapplied every few months. I started by buying one bottle of each but I ended up actually using three bottles of cutting board oil before the countertop stopped soaking up the oil. Yeah, it took literally one and a half liters of oil to saturate this countertop over the course of four to five coats. Now that it's saturated though, future coats will require far less oil. Fully saturating the butcher block is critical to prevent it from soaking up water and other liquids which might spill on it and create stains. The last actual woodworking that needs to be done is constructing the drawer fronts. I chose to match the same style and proportions of the existing shaker drawer fronts in the rest of my kitchen. The rails are one and a quarter inch wide, the styles are two and a quarter inch wide, the entire drawer front is slightly over three quarters of an inch thick, the center panels are quarter inch plywood which fit in a groove, and the rails and styles are joined together with mortises on the styles and tenons on the rails. I made these drawer fronts out of 5 quarter poplar, which means it's 1 inch thick. I would have preferred to just buy 3 quarter inch poplar to use, but it's critical that drawer fronts are perfectly flat, and I couldn't find any 3 quarter inch poplar that wasn't at least a little bit warped. So I bought thicker stuff and milled it down to final thickness with my jointer and planer. After thicknessing, I ripped the styles to their final width of two and a quarter inches, but I did not cut them to length. I cross-cut all of the rails to their final length, making sure to account for the added length of the tenons, but did not rip them to their final width. By waiting to cut the styles to their final length, I can cut a groove for the center panel in fewer passes on the saw. And by waiting to rip the rails to their final width, I can cut many tenons all at once. I first cut the groove in the styles with a quarter inch thick dado stack. Then I used a test piece to fine tune the height of the dado stack to cut the tenons on the rails. If the stack is too high, the tenon ends up too thin and the joint will end up weak. If the stack is too low, the tenon ends up too thick and it won't fit into the groove in the style at all. It's critical to get this fit exact 
And I'm not gonna lie, it took me literally 20 minutes of slightly adjusting the blade height up and down until I got a reasonable fit. In fact, this fit is a little looser than I would prefer, but it's just within the acceptable range. With the blade height locked in, I can cut out the tendons on all of the rails. As I mentioned earlier, by leaving the rails wider, I can cut many tendons at once, and I can also eventually switch back to a normal table saw blade to cut off the unavoidable blowout on the back sides of each cut. Finally, I cross cut the styles to their final lengths and switched back to the dado stack to cut the quarter inch groove in the rails. With a dry fit of one drawer front, I made sure all of the pieces fit together as expected, and I measured the necessary sizes of the plywood center panels, which I then cut out on the table saw. The same advice applies here for sizing the panels as it did for the drawer bottoms. The panels should be a sixteenth smaller than necessary to fit comfortably in the groove and keep everything nice and square during glue up without being too big to prevent the joints from closing. Gluing up the drawer fronts was straightforward. The important part was to make sure that they were all flat and square after the clamps were applied and that enough glue was applied in the joints. I also glued the plywood panel in place because the drawer handles will eventually be connected through the panel and it shouldn't be allowed to wiggle within the groove. I applied some wood filler to the exposed end grain of the styles to hide the joint a bit better after paint is applied. Since the drawer handles will be bolted through the quarter inch plywood panel, it's important that the void between the drawer and this panel be filled, otherwise the drawer handle will deform the panel if the bolts are over tightened. To solve this problem, I ripped some scrap 2x4 construction lumber to the necessary thickness to fill the gap and glued it onto the back of each drawer front. To prep for painting the drawer fronts, I lightly sanded all of the surfaces, especially the sharp edges, then primed and painted with a roller. Again, a paint sprayer probably would have been a better method here. To drill the holes for the drawer handles, I made a template out of scrap plywood. This ensures that all handles are consistently located. Using a template is definitely more precise than hand measuring each drawer front. After using an awl to mark the hole locations on the larger drawer fronts, I shortened the template to be used on the smaller drawers and marked those hole locations as well. I used a brad point bit to drill the holes for the drawer handles, once again drilling directly into my outfeed table. Next I moved back upstairs and prepared to bolt the island to the floor. To be honest, the island is so massively heavy that it's not going to be moving on its own, but since I'm going to run electric wire down through a leg into a narrow hole in the floor, it's important that it doesn't shift at all. To position the island directly centered under two ceiling lights, I hung some scissors and a knife as plumb bobs and measured to make sure the spacing was equal on each side. 
Then I marked the outline of each foot on the floor, including the center foot underneath the cabinet. I pre-drilled through the floor in all five locations and slid the cabinet back into place. Oh yeah, this is when I decided I didn't like the color and repainted it to the darker shade. Moving on, next is electrical. Let me give a disclaimer right off the bat. I am not a qualified electrician, so if you are planning to copy what I've done here, please consult an expert and make sure you abide by all local codes and permitting processes. For that reason, I won't go into too much detail besides showing how I routed and secured the Romex wire within the cabinet, how I passed the Romex down through the central leg, through the floor, and connected it to a circuit in my basement, and how I wired up one GFCI and one non-GFCI outlet into the bench. To bolt the four outer legs to the floor, I measured their expected location from my basement below and caveman hacked into the ceiling with a hammer. My basement is already a disaster, so I don't think my wife even noticed the new holes. Looking up from below, I can see the pre-drilled holes I made earlier to know exactly where the legs are located. I secured each leg from below with one large three and a half inch timber screw, which was left over from a structural project I did in my house. To finish the bare plywood of the drawers, I first removed the drawer slides, then applied two coats of Armor Seal Wipe-On Polyurethane on the inside and the visible sides. Applying finish to the drawers is somewhat optional, but since I'm planning to store food in many of these drawers, I wanted to make sure that they at least had some water resistance. Once the finish dried, I reattached the drawer slides using the existing screw holes. The last step is attaching the drawer fronts. I made some 1 8 inch spacers out of some old business cards and started with the top drawer fronts first. I placed the drawer front where I wanted it with spacers, held it in place with one hand, and drilled through the drawer with the other. I repeated this process with all of the top drawers before moving down to the bottom ones. The larger drawer fronts are so big that just the two bolts in the handle aren't strong enough to really prevent that drawer front from shifting around slightly, so I pre-drilled and used two more screws from the inside of the drawer into the styles of the drawer fronts to hold them more securely. And there you go. That is how to design and build a kitchen island from scratch. Thank you for sticking around through all of the gory details of this video. I hope it was useful to you. Please leave a comment down below telling me any thoughts you have about this build. And as always, thank you for showing your support by liking this video and subscribing to my channel. And a special thank you to my Patreons as well. Thanks for watching.